Morning, everyone. I would like to start this meeting by recognizing the homeland of the 30 First Nation communities of this area we now call the Fraser Valley Regional District, where we live, work, and learn. Important decisions that we make at a local government level can affect First Nation communities, Indigenous peoples, and organizations in many different ways, both today and in the future. So as part of our collective responsibility, I commit that part of our we continually examine the work we do to ensure that our project plans, initiatives, and discussion are guided by the principles of inclusion, collaboration, and reconciliation. With that in mind, I'd like to call to order the December 12, 2023 meeting of the Electoral Area Service Committee of the Whole. Turn things to our CAO. Thank you, Chair Dickey. So looking for approval of the agenda, agenda, and late items. Motion, Director Dixon moves, second, Director Johnson. All in favor, contrary, motion carries. 4.1 is the FBRD draft 2024 to 2028 financial plan for electoral area-wide services. And we will begin and turn things over to our controller, Beth Klein, and our CFO, Kelly Lonsbro. Thank you, Ms. Kinneman. Good morning, committee members, colleagues, and members of the public. Welcome to the Electoral Area Services Committee of the Whole meeting to review the FBRD draft 2024 to 2028 financial plan that covers the electoral area wide budgets this morning. So this morning we have set aside time to review the budgets that apply to all properties within each electoral area. Over the past couple of weeks, as part of the electoral area director reviews of service area budgets within each electoral area, we have covered a number of financial plan overarching guidelines that apply to all aspects of the budget. These materials are, as are attached as part of the materials we will cover today as a point of completeness. The FRD team continues to focus on efficiencies, leaving no stone unturned as it relates to financials. We continue to seek external funding opportunities. Budgets firstly focus on required spending in order to meet existing or legislated requirements, followed by options for new initiatives or proposed projects. These are so shown separately in the slides. Budgets are prepared with the best known information at a point in time. Known risks are included in the materials for director awareness. As regional district budgeting is focused on the dollars required to support services, as opposed to the tax rates, Presentation materials are focused on the dollars required to balance the budgets. Tax impacts to average residential taxpayers are shown for information, but those amounts can and will change as the property assessment process evolves. The materials in the slides today are based on 2023 property assessments. A very important part of our financial planning process is the continuous review of FERD assets at risk to ensure that we continue to manage our assets and in particular those at risk in a financially prudent manner. These materials are also included in the presentation package for your awareness. Budget presentation at the FERD is an iterative process with approvals at specific stages in the process. In line with this, we are pleased to advise that the public consultation now mirrors that staged approach mm. and launched in September of this year on our Have Your Say platform. Following today's session, we will make any necessary changes and update the Have Your Say site. Next up in January is a focus on regional budgets with municipal CFO consultation, a board committee of the whole before returning to the board again in February for final financial plan adoption. Before I pass this presentation over to Beth Klein, the FERD's controller, I also wanted to point out that today we have prioritized the budgets in which we will cover based upon the tax implications. The focus is on the budgets with taxation increases greater than 6.5%. All electoral area wide budgets are included in the materials and we are of course happy to take questions on any of the materials. At the end of today's meeting, we will be seeking a motion to approve all of the budgets included in the package today. So with that, I'd like to introduce Beth Klein, the FERD's controller, who will take us through the electoral area, the electoral area wide service draft financial plan for 2024 to 2028. Thank you. Okay, so on the screen here, we have 
we'll have the uh, electoral area-wide budgets. Um, these are all the budgets that will be taxed in this section. Um, and it's a summary view of the total requisition dollars for each of the service areas. Okay, so here we see the 2023 requisition from last year. Um, this is the electoral area portion. Um, broken out is part of our building inspection for the Harrison Hot Springs portion at the bottom here. Um, so we will be talking about these budgets. Um, 2024 requisition total dollars are here in this column for 4.3 million. And the total increase year from 2023 to 2024 lives on the right here. In your resource sections um, that we've provided this morning, these areas are broken out by electoral area. So you can see those individual increases for each electoral area. So if there are any questions on that, if there are not any questions on that, we can move into the individual areas, starting with the electoral area administration. So the service area, the service area is the electoral administration. It's providing um, the administration expenses for all of the eight electoral areas. Key highlights of this financial plan for 2024 to 2028, um, we are continuing to use surplus to soften tax requisition. It is slowly decreasing throughout the five-year plan um, and it will, it will stop being used by 2028. Um, over the five-year plan, the increases are largely due to inflation. Uh, there's some proposed um, increases that we'll talk about in a couple slides here. The, tax, the taxation in this service area is segmented to the EAs based on a board resolution from 2014. Um, there is two separate sections. There's a section where we tax specific service or specific electoral areas and we tax for common areas. And we'll go into those in the next couple of slides. The ongoing initiatives for this budget um, at a high level are the elected officials fees and expenses, the electoral area elections, electoral area-wide administration, and the DeRoche Centre operations. So that um, resolution from 2014 that dictates how we should be taxing for this service area is broken into two, two different areas. So we have common director expenses. The slide on the um, screen here dictates what we should be taxing to all areas based on assessment. Um, so we can see the East meeting travels and meals, um, one delegate for the conferences for UBCM, FCM, and the UBCM forum, um, any East directed attendance at workshops or conferences, um, public hearings, strategic planning meetings for East and communications expenses. So internet usage, cell phones. So these expenses are taxed to all electoral areas based on assessment. You want us to jump in at any time? Yeah. Yes. We have Director Castle. Um, thank you. My understanding is with the director expenses that that is uh, uh, this next year's budget will be based on this year's expenses. Are we able to see kind of year over year how those are trending? We can certainly provide them. Um, we don't have them right now right. to look at, but we can provide them for sure. I, I'm just based on that on that on that process. Um, it, it's something that we're not actually making a conscious decision of. It's something that's just happening based on our activities, and I would love to see kind of year over year how those are trending um, as we look at this uh, service area 102. Um, it represents some of the largest increases in the area G overall budget. And I'd like to just make sure that we've got kind of a handle on, on those director expenses and that we understand how those expenses are impacting our budgets. So that would be useful information, not for maybe this cycle, but for consideration for future. Thank you, Director Castle, Director Dixon. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on that, just to confirm. So am I looking at right now on this one, and I, I get that you don't have all the individual breakdowns, but is 102 all of our expenses? Like, so if I went to UBCM, is that coming out of here? And if Director Castle chose not to, he's paying for me. Like, how did covering that a little bit, or is it yeah. separate? Yeah, I can go over that. So the one that we just went over, this is the common one that goes to all EAs. So the the common expense tax to everyone in the electoral areas is only for one delegate. Um, so it'd be the chair or a designate. Going into this slide, we'll talk about specific director fees. These ones are taxed to the individual areas. So when we look at this, that conference attendance is on this list. So aside from the chair of EASC, everyone's conference attendance would go to their specific areas. So if Director Castle chose, using your example, to not go, then his area wouldn't be taxed for it. Um, so also in this area that's directly taxed to those individual electoral areas is the weekly travel and meals to the FBRD office, aside from ESC and board, um, conference attendance for the individuals um, that are not the chair or the designate, any workshop and training opportunities, and the inter-constituency travel. And so for this area is where it's taxed for prior year spending versus what we've budgeted um, in the common area. These ones are based on what we've budgeted. And it's the individual that I'm interested in. So I don't know if if everyone else is interested in their area, but for area G, I'd be interested in that, please. Director McAhonick. Just kind of in line with that, I recall vaguely um, in past years, looking at um, news articles where we talk about different regional directors' expenses in the paper and things like that. So this is pub a matter of public record at some time too, isn't it? Like, uh, I'm, are you talking about Sophie? Maybe the so the statement of financial information report. So possibly, I just remember um, one director and a news story. Um, about one director having very large expenses at one time. I wasn't a part of this or anything, but um, I know that they had a lot of travel expenses or whatever. So I guess it's really good that we kind of monitor our own expenses so we're not, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we are required to report every year on our, we call it the SOFI report, the Statement of Financial Information. And that includes all of the director's expenses, whether it's taxed to each area, it doesn't matter. They're all lumped together and, and reported out. Thank you. Davidson? Yeah, go ahead, Director Davidson. So I think similar to having mulled over this one, um, I learned something new, which is, which is always interesting. I'd always thought that the uh, um, all director expenses were essentially aggregated and uh, taxed equally back to all electoral area directors, all, all sorry, all electoral areas based on um, assessment. What I've learned now is that that's not the case. And what I didn't realize is that service area um, creation bylaws allow for that level of granularity in um in how expenses are distributed so that you could, for example, have two, two homes within or two properties within a service area, both assessed at, at exactly the same, both the same class of, of property. Um, but one's paying more taxes than another um, based on um, their director's expenses. And that's that's surprising to me. I didn't I didn't know that to be the case. So I think with that in mind, um, I would like to see the the, the kind of breakdown that uh, Director Castle is is uh, speaking to it would be helpful for me. Thank you, Chair Dickey. If we could just get our corporate officer to comment on this one, there's a bit of a nuance here that I think would be important for the committee. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Through the chair to Director Davidson, um, under the Local Government Act, there are some services for which we are not required to have a service area, and electoral area administration is one of those. 
So we don't actually have a service area bylaw. We're not required to create one under the act. Do, um, that That's fair. Um, when you don't have to create a service area in order to, um, a service area bylaw in order to have that service area, um, does that also lift constraints on how um, costs on that ser on that service are distributed? I mean, is is it totally at the uh, totally at essentially the board's discretion as to how all one hundred two expenses land um, on any given property? Um, chair Dickey, I, I don't mind answering this one through the chair to Director Davidson. Um, this one is uh, enshrined in our legislation, um, electoral area administration, um, and we have a board resolution that outlines the um, the allocation of how how the expenses are are taxed. So, um, aside from the legislation and the the resolution, then they also must be in compliance, of course, with the travel and expense policy, um, and of course the remuneration policy. So we have we have various policies that wrap up, and the resolution is really what's addressing how they're taxed. Um, it's something that's quite complicated for the team to do. Not nothing that we really want to replicate on other other um, areas, for example. Um, but but I think it was a great call that Beth identified this. Um, it's a new um, addition to our presentation materials, and we felt it was really important that you that you have uh, visibility into this. Right. No. Thank you. So yeah, just like Director Castle, just having that breakdown would would be helpful for for context. Um, I had assumed everything was pooled and shared equally. If it's not the case, then it becomes certainly more relevant to know um, on an individual basis what 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 I'm looking like, like as opposed to other directors. Yeah, Thanks. of course, we're happy to provide that. Thank you. Good, thank you, Director Davidson. Ms. Klein. Okay, so moving into our um, proposed increases for 2024. Um, we have two positions for um, 2024. So the one position is a permanent position. Um, so that cost will continue on for the full five-year plan. Um, the second is a temporary. Um, and so we can talk about um, this these items in closed if there are any discussions regarding labor. So looking at the five-year horizon of this budget, um, we're bringing in that additional um, permanent position for the full five years. Um, we have the temporary position. This is funded by um, surplus as well as um, external sources. The DeRoche office update for $10,000. And um, the just pointing out here that the asset management program beginning in 2024 um, there is some internal costs for that one. Um, the rest of the, the program will be budgeted through the regional administration budget. Um, in January, we'll talk about that one. And we have 2026, we have our EA elections, and we have a placeholder of about $50,000 to be um, looked at. So because this is the first financial slide that we're looking at, I'll go a little bit about um, the template that we use for all of our service areas. Um, so this imitates an income statement. So on the top section, we have our funding sources. Um, this is our 2023 amended budget, and we have our five-year plan. So each of the five years. Um, so here we can see our total funding coming in, and it's broken down into these sections. Um, at the very top, we have our tax requisition. And that's what comes in on that uh, financial summary that we've already seen. On the bottom is all of the expenses that we have. Um, and so this is our 2024 column here. On the right, we have our savings dollar values. Uh, we have two different savings surplus accounts. Um, and on the financial summary, you can see we're transferring in, as I said, some surplus to soften taxation over the financial plan. And this line below here is to put away into savings. If I may just jump into, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, finance team, uh, just for the committee's benefit. So transfer to savings surplus reverse, reserve, 16,750. That's the $50,000 for elections that's spread out over the life 
of the plan. So in 2026, the reason that it's uh, blank is because that would be an election year when you spend those funds. Correct. Mr. Bill? Oh, pardon me. Director, oh, no. director, up. I'm going to cherish the wake up. Go ahead. Um, yeah, just for clarity, on the previous slide, um, the additional staff members, um, the one that Daniel calls uh, 105, are those both funded not through surplus, but funded through additional taxes? So the additional engineering, this top one, is funded through taxation. Um, the temporary is not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director McElhone, could you, or pardon me, put it on. So I'm just, so for 23 and 105, five, so is that an actual and it's amended to meet the actual for the grants? This one is a, a it's an amended budget, so it's not actuals at this time. Um, it includes any budget amendments we've done throughout the year. Okay. So I was just wondering, so is that kind of standard that what you anticipate to, to get for grants? Is there like standard grants that are about that? And then you just put them in kind of conservatively and then try and get more? Or is that generally what you get? I'm just curious. For the five-year financial plan, so for 2024 to 2028, that's 76000 um, there's two different grants that are in there. So we have a grants in lieu of taxes um, that comes through our requisition dollars. Um, and then there is a, a grant that we do get annually in there as well. So it's a, a fixed kind of thing. So and that's just a standard. Yeah, it has decreased um, a couple of years ago, but um, yeah, it's standard each year. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Director McAhonick, Director Castle. Thank you. And just to follow up on uh, Director Wardenberg's question, uh, the external sources uh, assumes 25% funding by external sources. What are the external sources? Oh. Oops. Oh, thank you. Through the chair to Director Castle, we'll just ask that we hold questions on that um, to do to labor. We'll get into closed. Thank you. Okay, Director Dixon. This might be a closed question too. I'm not sure. So um, maybe I'll just leave it. I'll come back. Okay, thank you. Back to Ms. Klein. Okay, so our next budget is the emergency management budget. Um, this service is for managing and maintaining the emergency management program policy and service. Key highlights of this plan, um, we are including the update to the emergency management plan and hazard reports, as well as integrating the FireSmart program that was approved last year, um, as well as the personnel into the service area. Core or core ongoing initiatives are um, our core services, the emergency planning, community preparedness, our emergency operational center, exercise and training, uh, evacuee services, and fire smart. We are um, increasing our contributions to savings for any unrecoverable response and recovery costs. So budget challenges and risks. Um, in this budget, you're really considering the changing environment and increased ha hazard events, as well as any potential for unrecoverable response and recovery costs. So with our um, with the disaster financial assistance program, it's between I believe seventy five percent and ninety percent of uh, recover recoverable costs, and the rest are um, for us to cover. We also have new provincial legislation as of November twenty twenty three, and as we discussed in our previous budget meetings, um, we really don't know what these these effects are at this time, um, but it. It has been um, approved in November, so it is active. The other considerations for this budget, um, we really have to consider the environment of the electoral areas, um, lots of rich natural assets that we're dealing with. Um, we have a large land base and small tax base in that large land base. 
um, and there is a high expectancy on um, resources with no public works department. So looking at the proposed projects for 2024, um, there is a list of four on the screen in front of us, totaling to 115,000. Um, these are heavily grant dependent. We have the evacuation route guidance for um, electoral area C or Hemlock Village, the 2024 ESS project, the EOC exercise and training program, and flood response level guidance in 2023. Moving into the five-year horizon. So we have summarized up here those 2024 projects, totaling that 115. Um, looking throughout the five-year plan, we are including that Fire Smart and Resiliency, Resiliency Program. Um, it is heavily grant dependent. Um, the evacuation planning goes throughout the five years as well. The EOC improving and training, as well as the ESS grant equipment and um, a one-time purchase. So I'm not sure whether this is the time to ask the question, but the Fire Smart program is grant dependent. I got the um, understanding that that was becoming part of our emergency management budget. Or... Yep, so the position is permanent, um, but the program, so there's program elements and I, I can pass it on to Graham to to fill in some blanks on that one. Graham or Shreya. Thank you. To the chair, to Director Dickey. Um, we will be applying for annual Fire Smart grants to continue the program implementation, things such as Fire Smart risk hazard assessments, uh, homeowners assessments, the rebate program, and some of the subsidiary program elements. So what is tax funded right now would be the salaried position only and we'll continue to rely upon the grants as and when they're available to us to continue sponsoring program initiatives. Thank you, uh, Director Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so when, when I look at this and, and the increases, if I just look at uh, that slide that shows overall, to me, it looks like a 20% increase, more or less, in um, emergency management funds, and yet, when I look at these slides, it say it says all grant dependent or apply for grants or things like that. So, do we tax at that rate? And then, if we get grants, uh, I mean, you've already taxed people, so that's I'm just not quite under understanding what the process is. Yeah, so I can answer it, and Trina can fill in any blanks. Um, so last year it was approved to bring on the Fire Smart position permanently. Um, so that 2024 is the first year that we're doing that. And so that's what that big increase is for. Um, you can see that because we have received the grant up to the, I believe it's the end of 2024, um, there is some excess funding that we're putting into savings. Um, this is to make sure that we have enough funding for any of those unrecoverable costs for any um, emergency events. That's all that. Yes, so the 20%, and I know that's ballpark, the approximate 20% increase is just to pay for the fire smart person that last year we um, approved. Yes. Okay, thank you. Director Dixon, Director Kelsey. Uh, thank you. And just, just to clarify that, it's not just. There's inflationary cost in there as well, which we can assume would be six, seven percent. So so it's not just that. That makes up the bulk of it, but there's also the the annual inflationary um, costs in there as well. Um, uh, both of my questions were answered uh, with the, the previous questions. Um, I just want to um, just make a note that I appreciate the investment in this area. I appreciate that we're going after um, grant funding um, for emergency operations. Um, <clears throat> uh, I did have a question. Oh, of the initiatives, uh, are there any in there that are actually, mm, what's the proper term, statutory or, or imposed on us from another level of government? Which ones do we have to do and which ones 
because I know that that comes into play with this with this budget. Thank you through the chair to director Castle. Uh, we are heavily reliant on meeting these objectives to meet our statutory obligations. Um, many of these projects were planned and proposed as part of the five year plan last year under the previous legislation. Uh, we, of course, still don't know what we don't know about the new legislation. However, moving ahead with these projects that are grant reliant and dependent will help us uh, in in very certain terms, at least working towards the goals of the new legislation as well. Uh, we are required to have an emergency management plan. We do need to have evacuation guidance as part of that plan. We are statutorily required to have an exercise and training program. Flood response guidance is an essential component of having a, a land base and floodplain, and we are legally required to provide evacuee supports when we evacuate our constituents. Uh, so again, we will continue to apply for grants to meet those legal obligations and where we receive those grants, we will be able to deliver on those projects. Thank you, Director Castle, Director Wardenberg. Uh, yeah, just a, just for clarity on the transfer to uh, surplus or savings. Um, so that's for potential non-recoverables. Um, and how, I guess, if a short explanation, how would you come to that number? It's a lot of seems like a big number. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, in, in full openness here, we have have a board approved position that is to be salaried. And so we will continue with that position. Um, I believe the board had been advised that if grant funding was made available to us to fund that coordinator role that we would consider bringing that back in and applying the grant towards that position. That being said, the grant funding was successful. 20% uh, of the budget last year did cover a salaried amount, and then the remainder is being factored in this year. And so what we're actually doing is allocating that grant back into savings to ensure that we have it. As far as the number directly for unrecoverable response and recovery costs, uh, there's no math behind that other than knowing that we go through a permission slip process when we activate our emergency operations center. We seek funding from emergency management climate readiness to provide us compensation backwards after we've spent that money up front. And it's a very paper laden and time durated process. Uh, we're still carrying claims from 2020 if I am tracking our details accurately. And so it's really important that we have the ability to meet the payment of our expenses and then ride out the, again, unknowns of the new legislation as we don't know what will be eligible and won't be eligible. And so we're taking that which we do have a grant funding for and making sure that we're making an investment into that savings to, to better posture ourselves for the unknowns. And if I can just further add to that a little bit, for those of you who were not here during the Atmospheric River event, the board actually put forward a motion, um, a resolution to UBCM uh, with respect to the challenges that regional districts face during an emergency activation and suggested that it might be ideal if the province of British Columbia provided regional districts with um, an amount of money to keep in, to, in their emergency management accounts surpluses for these kinds of, of reasons. In a municipality, of course, uh, many of them have public works departments, they have staff that are um, in, in, in those kinds of positions. They can deploy their resources much more quickly, whereas with regional districts, not having this kind of um, account to draw from it really forces us to rely on that paper process that Trina described. And so uh, this is one way I know that um, Graham and Trina and the team uh, contemplated over time uh, of building up a small reserve amount uh, for this service area for those situations so that when residents in the electoral areas are needing help, uh, there may be situations where we feel confident in the EOC that we're going to get those costs recovered but we don't necessarily want to wait 24 hours, three days, five days for that approval to come through. Thank you. That was a great uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wardenberg, Director McElhone. 
<clears throat> so if you were going to have a number for a pot of uh, contingency funds for this, ideally ballpark it, if you would. Thank you. Currently, our emergency management bylaw provides a responsibility and authority to Emergency Operations Center director to spend up to $250,000 of unbudgeted money for critical life and safety actions, and also provides a power for our CAO to approve the expenditure up to $500,000 of unbudgeted money. And so that's two budgetary amounts that are not part of our traditional budgeting. And I think that we would be striving to achieve the goalpost of 500,000 and maintain that over the perpetuity of our program until we have a greater understanding of what funding might be available to us to maintain response and recovery costs under the new legislation. Thank you. So that would be like a contingency just specific for that. So that would be a good year end to ask me. Thank you. Thank you, Director McAhonick. Ms. Klein. Okay, <clears throat> moving into our next budget is our bylaw enforcement budget. Um, the service area is to investigate, process, and resolve uh, contraventions to the FBRD bylaws. Ongoing initiatives for this area are to develop a bylaw policy endorsed by the board, um, setting clear directions to by the officers to assist with residents in resolving those contraventions. Some risks and challenges for this budget. Um, this, the revenue or funding generated by the bylaw department is minimal. Um, uh, any budget reductions would result in service level um, redu reductions in the department. In this budget, we are using surplus again to soften taxation. Um, it will eventually be depleted, which will require an increase in the future. Um, this does, as it's depleting or as it's reducing throughout the five-year plan, it does slowly increase taxation. But when it runs out, um, it will be a sharp increase. So we try to work to make sure that doesn't happen too drastically. Other considerations for this service area, um, the development of a bylaw policy will assist officers in a clear approach to processes. Um, there's a lot of time spent to gain compliance, um, improving cost recovery through increased ticketing. So the two proposed projects for um, this service area are the policy and digital permitting. Um, both of them are staff time. There's no increase to taxation. Looking at um, the 2023 to 2024 requisition, this is largely due to um, the position that was approved last year to be um, increased. Uh, last year was just a partial, partial year. This year is the full year of that position being included in the budget. And that is mainly the increase for this area. If there are any questions, I can move forward. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we have our Fraser Valley Regional Library. Um, the purpose of this service area is for residents to access the Fraser Valley Regional Library system. Um, the budget plan for this, um, this year is based on the Fraser Valley Regional Library budget for 2024. So you can see here that this regional library service is um, what is paid to the FBRL, and that's what is based on their budget. Um, we have some operational support uh, for snow clearing and um, small items like that as well. The increase is, is mostly due to the increase for the library services. Director Castle, pipe up if I don't see it, please. Yeah, thank you. Is this is this budget imposed on us? I I believe we did participate in the the budget process for the FBRL. And 
the reserve and surplus for this service area, what are scenarios where that would be utilized? Thank you for the question through the chair to Director Castle. Um, one off the top could be uh, capital upgrades to the, the two library facilities. Um, in, in my short time here, I've seen requests come through. So that could be um, one one example of increases. I don't know if they, they're, they're pretty structured at VRL on their timing of their budget approvals. So I don't see anything uh, on their operating side, but that could be an example if, if something um, unplanned happened with one of the buildings. So our contribution for something unplanned. Exactly. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Director Castle. Talk to Ms. Pliny. Okay, so that is the end of the presentations for over 6.5% increase. Um, so at this time, I think, Chair Dickey, it would be wise uh, for you to seek a resolution to go into close to complete the uh, presentation. Okay, looking for a motion. Move Director Dixon, second Director Castle. Discussion, hearing none. All in favor, contrary, motion carries. Okay, and just give us a couple minutes to set up the room. Uh, put up the slides to where we left off, which I believe was uh, the resolution. Uh, but again, uh, there are other budget items. If uh, you wanted to break any of those out that are in the resource section and uh, ask staff any follow-up questions on those items. Okay, Director Council. Thank you, Chair Dickey. Uh, I just uh, want to just clarify uh, service area 256. That's the animal control service area. Um, uh, huge increase uh, in the in the requisition for that uh, with the addition of a couple of new areas. And uh, my question before we received the information today was with regards to how that affected the other areas. So it appears to me that uh, while we're the requisition amount in the overall service area is going up quite a lot, the the impact of that is felt mostly by the two new areas and the existing areas in that service area are not affected. I'm just looking for clarification with, from staff on that. Yeah, so through the chair to Director Castle, um, the increase for the areas that existed prior to the two coming on um, have an increase based on inflation. Um, the two new additional areas that have come on in this this year um, they are to bring on staffing to staff that those areas. Good. Thank you, Director Castle. Uh, question through uh, to uh, staff uh, regarding bylaw enforcement. You see a fairly uh, big increase there and wondering what the um, background is to that. For bylaw enforcement, um, last year there was a, a position approved or an increase to a position approved. Um, it was a part part year, so uh, only half the year. Uh, 2024, it would be for the full year. So that's the increase there. Okay, thank you. Discussion. Director Dixon. Um, I guess I'm looking a year ahead now because we've we've this budget we see the uh, impacts of decisions we made last year. Are we making any of those decisions now that are going to come forward next year beyond the the possible one we just talked about on close that that are going to see these huge increases kind of across the board? Through the chair to Director Dixon, um, off the cuff, what I would say is we've done our best to plan for the five years. So what you see for 2025 is what you should be expecting next year. So we're getting in a good uh, trajectory um, and discipline here at the FERD to make sure that 
we're not just looking at 2024, um, but we're looking at the full five-year period. And you'll note through the presentations um, in electoral areas, as well as the EA-wide presentations, we do comment on how this year, um, specifically the 2024 year specifically lines up with what we predicted last year. So quite often we've been saying it's in line with what, what we've had last year. Now off the top, I think what you're also asking is, are there any part year impacts of positions that we're planning only a part, partial of the year? I, I can't recall any, but I would just lean on the fact that we're planning for a five year period. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't see any other discussion staff. Director Castle, go ahead. Thanks, Chair Dickey. Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate staff's uh, thoroughness through this process, uh, uh, walking us through it, asking, uh, answering all of our questions. Uh, I don't believe that we asked for any amendments. So based on that, I'd like to move the motion in front, the resolution in front of us. Davidson, second. Thank you, Director Davidson. Discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Contrary motion carries. So that brings us, Chair Dickey, to the end of the presentation. Uh, unless there are any other items, uh, we can look for a motion to adjourn. Moved adjournment, Director Castle, second Director Johnson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Contrary, motion carries. Thank you very much, committee. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.